Welcome to our 13th presentation in programming mobile devices. Today what we're going to do, let's start with the scrum board. We, let's see, I'll try to fit this on our screen, it's a little bit tricky. So this is our scrum board on Scrumly, Scrum, or Scrummy rather, scrummy.com slash plant places. And we have created our interfaces in a previous lecture, so I'm going to go ahead and grab that and move that over to done. We also created our stub implementation, at least enough to get us where we want to go. What we're going to do now is we're going to create working implementations. And by that, what I mean is we're going to use the network to actually search live plant data. So that's what we'll start working on today. We still have a couple of stories that we need to get to, which is add GPS to specimen entry screen. We'll probably cover that in our next lecture. And then we'll have a new story we don't have on here yet, which is we want to be able to use the camera as well. And that's going to be important for our search by color functionality. So a lot of fun things going on, but the, the task that we're working on in this lecture, the one in progress, is to create working implementations. So uh, I'm going to use a presentation. And by the way, I've taught this course as BlackBerry programming two or three times. I've taught it as Android programming two or three times. I wrote this lecture on networking a while ago and honestly never ended up using it in a class because, uh, well, honestly, we never had time to get to it. So I want to go ahead and cover it now because I think it will be something of interest in just a moment. In any case, we're going to use the uh, presentation HTTP networking. Now, one trick is we're going to need to have something that we can, something on the internet that we can search against. So, if I go to my web browser and I open up a new window for plant places, okay, and let's see, I let's say I search on ABs, we'll see that I get results back. Now, in theory, I could go to a web page like this, press control U, get the source, and try to parse through that. That's a lot of information, though. That's a lot of useless information there, the HTML markup. What I want is just data. So I'm going to bring the browser down here so we can see the URL. What I'll do instead is I'm going to go to plantplaces.com and then Perl and then mobile, and then I believe it's called view, yeah, there we go, view plants. Um, this is something that I wrote on plantplaces.com on the uh, server side to be able to process plain text requests and return a plain text response. So take a look at the URL here. It's plantplaces.com slash Perl slash mobile slash viewplants.pl question mark genus equals abs. What I'm saying here is I want it to give me back all matches where genus is abs. So I hit enter and we see a fairly plain looking response. Doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense. If I hold control and press U, it will show me the source of this page and we'll see that this response is basically a semicolon delimited plain text response of all plants that have the genus Abies. So I set up several of these through plant places. I did one to search on, on uh, genus, one to search on species, and then the one to search on color as well for the color match search for the camera. So the one I'm going to use now is the one for uh, genus that will show me all plants that have a given genus. One thing I've always thought would be neat would be to have a uh, have a mobile application that uses this phenological calendar. Now, we're all learning programming now, and I'll tell you something that I learned from taking courses in horticulture, and that is that chemistry is the programming language of life. And what's very interesting here is that I'll put in uh, my zip code and today's date. What's very interesting is that things in nature are timed on a very interesting formula. While that's searching, I'm going to try and open up a new tab here. It's called Growing Degree Days. 
It's a very interesting formula that a surprising amount of life is timed by. So what we do is we take the maximum temperature for the day, uh, add the minimum temperature, divide by 2, and subtract a base. Uh, so here's a Celsius reading, the high of the day 23, the low 12, divide by 2. In other words, take the average of the high and the low, subtract 10, and that gives you your growing degree days for that day, 7.5. What's interesting is this is the uh, phenological calendar. And what this shows is the growing degree days that have elapsed at a certain time. And that is what times a lot of things in, in life. What's interesting about this is it times a lot of things both in the plant world and also in the animal world. And so you can use this to see, you know, the date that I put in, for instance, shows, obviously a lot of these have passed, shows right now we're on growing degree day 1802. And this shows everything that has already happened, pine needle scale just happened, okay, and everything that is about to happen. So if you can take the growing degree day data, you can smartly predict when certain things like uh, like insect emergence will happen that might have an effect on crops or might have an effect on plants. And because it's based on growing degree days, not calendar days, but growing degree days, it will happen at different times every year, but uh, it, will, it will always happen at this given growing degree day. So you can be smarter about when you do things like apply uh, fertilizer, apply, apply insecticide, apply fungicide, so on and so forth. So this is a set of data that's available from Ohio State and while it's HTML, it's fairly simple. I always thought this would be something neat to be able to plug into an Android app so that you could say how many growing degree days have elapsed, what is the next major horticultural event I need to watch out for, uh, is there something I need to spray for soon, should I be looking for fungus or something like that. So uh, many times what we'll find is that there is value and aggregating data together from different sources. Maybe I could combine growing degree days with a weather map. And that way I see not only when uh, an insect is in the larval stage and needs to be controlled, but I can also see when it's going to rain and maybe that will help me make a more optimal decision on when to sp spray an insecticide or a fungicide. Or maybe I can look historically at rain and determine is rain one of the inputs that determines the spread of fungus? Which, yes, it is. The amount of moisture will determine that. Uh, maybe I can look at a history of rain data, combine that with the phenological calendar, and decide how much fungus to, or how much fungicide to spray, if any at all. So, what we're seeing here is that by aggregating data from different sources, we're able to make more informed decisions we're able to optimize when we might apply a fungicide or an insecticide, if we apply it at all. And so in this case, we're using information as a substitute for petroleum. In the old days, you might just say, oh, I always spray fungicide on these dates. I always spray insecticide on these dates. I always fertilize on these dates. Now with new information, we can say, well, we're running a bit ahead on growing degree days this year. Uh, we're running a bit light on rain this year. Therefore, I'm going to cut back my application of fungicide or maybe push it later into the year. And we see that we're using information uh, to make decisions that will optimize and frankly minimize our use of chemicals. So that's what's neat about our field is that many times a lot of projects that we work on are frankly making the world a better place and a lot of the funding for projects like ours are coming from savings on things like excessive use of fertilizer, fungicide, uh, so on and so forth. So using information to make better decisions. In any case, that's just a little background, some ideas uh, you know that you could use. Maybe you could go find some external data. I made my own data. This is data from the Plant Places website. And what I want to do now is I want to take a look at our project and I want to start thinking about how we can implement this. So 
we already have our iPlant service and our plant service stub. And the one method I'm the most concerned about right now is the fetch plant method. That's the one that I want to use. Now what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to want to try to get live data. And if I have a network error, I want to fail over and be able to access some offline data as well. So I, I am going to make a plant service that's not a stub. I'm going to make it the live implementation. Uh, but first I need to think about data access. How I'm going to have some data access objects that are going to be dealing with finding persisted data. So I'm going to make a new package. Right click on source, say new and package. And I'm going to name this package com.plantplaces.dao. A DAO is typically a data access object, which means it's dealing specifically with retrieving data from a data source. So it's pretty low level. It typically does not have business logic. Instead, it's dealing with getting data from a persistent storage area. Maybe a database, maybe a web service, uh, maybe a website, some kind of persistent uh, data. Now, what I first want to do is I want to make a network DAO. And, of course, we'll start with an interface. And I'll call this interface iNetworkDAO. Okay. And finish. This is going to be a very low-level interface here. It's just saying, give me, given this URL, tell me what I get. So I'll put a copyright on top. Okay, and then here we'll put a description. Uh, okay, access data from a network. Okay, this is going to have no knowledge of what a plant is. It purely is going to say, give me a URL and I'll give you a string back that that URL returns. Okay. So the method that I'll make here is I'll say public string request. Okay. String URI. Okay. Throws connect exception network. I'm sorry, IO exception. Actually, let's leave that off. I know we're going to need that, but let's leave that off and see what happens when we don't get that. Let's just leave it as a request. Uh, we'll, we will come back and clean that up. So I'll put a comment on here that says, given a URI, fetch the URI and return the response. This method does not have any intelligence about the data it is sending or receiving. Receiving. It simply is in charge of sending the data over a network and receiving the data from the network. Okay, param URI, the URI you wish to access return the data returned after accessing the URI. That's enough to get us started. That's enough to get us started. So I'll go ahead and save. And uh, now what I want to do is I want to actually offer an implementation of this. So once again, in the DAO or data access object package, I'm going to right click and choose class. By the way, what's the difference between DAO and DTO? A DTO is a data transfer object. Typically, that's an object with getters and setters. It's meant for moving data in a platform-independent manner across layers. So from DAO to service to UI. What's a DAO then? A DAO is typically going to have methods like fetch, insert, and update. And it's going to work hand-in-hand -hand with the DTO, but the DAO is going to deal with how to save this object, how to retrieve this object, things like that. It typically will not have getters and setters. It won't have many of them at least. So I add a new class and we're going to call this class network DAO. 
Okay, and we need to give it an interface to implement. And so I'm going to say I network DAO. There we go. And I'm going to choose OK and finish. Okay. Now, because it knows we're implementing an interface, it knows that we must implement a method within that interface. And here we see it has given us that method and it returns null. Uh, obviously, we want it to do something more than that. So, what we'll need to do next then is take a look at some of the network options we have available to us in Android programming. These uh, Android uses the Apache HTTP components, which uh, is here we go. Which I give them, uh, I give them kudos for using something that's a fairly open source project like this. So uh, for documentation here, just search on the Apache HTTP components, and you'll come up with a page like this. So this is not Android specific, which is nice, which means we can reuse it. When I looked at this, I saw a lot of classes that could do something very complex, but don't have to. To be honest with you, it's a lot of boilerplate stuff. So I thought the best thing to do would be to put the common boilerplate functionality in one network DAO and then just call it whenever needed. So here we go. First of all, if we wish to get network access, we have to add a permission, android.permission.internet. Now our permissions are going to be kept in the Android manifest. And as we know, the Android manifest is an XML based file that we can either edit with the XML or we can use an editor that Eclipse gives us that makes it a bit easier. So if I go into Eclipse, I click on Android Manifest, and then I choose the Permissions tab. Now, these icons up here can be a bit confusing. We have Permission Elements, Uses Permission, Permission Group, Permission Tree, Sorts Alphabetically. Well, what we want is we want the Uses Permission. So what we say is we want to tell the user we wish to use data. And if you've ever downloaded and installed an Android app, it will typically tell you right up front what permissions it requires. And so this is one of those permissions. So I choose the U. Uh-oh, gosh, I hope I didn't. Sorry, let me get rid of that, that guy. I think that's from. Okay, and I choose Add. And remember, I'm going to select Use as Permission, and then I choose OK. And now all I have to do on the right side is pick the permission. And so I scroll down and we saw there was an uh, internet and there we go. And then I choose save. And I go back to my Android manifest to make sure it looks good. Yep, that's what it should look like. And the actual XML, what it will generate is something like this, a uses permission tag, which just says I'm requesting internet access. Okay, not so bad. Okay, so then we have the Apache HTTP library. And again, this can be extended to do a lot of crazy things. But at the end of the day, our focus is going to be create a URL and then get a response back. And at this network level, that's all we care about. We'll write another layer called a probably a plant DAO, which will actually do something to create the URL and do something to parse the results that come back. But we'll save that for a moment. Okay, so what we're going to have is an HTTP client, default HTTP client object, HTTP git, response handler, and basic response handler. HTTP git will accept one of two different parameters. One is a string that represents a URI. Uh, and that's the one that I might use. I could use that or I could use the other one. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the other one is a URI object that we can use. We can use the Apache libraries to create. But for a simple discussion, let's just make our URI a normal string. Okay. Then we have a response handler, which says when I get a response from an HTTP request, I'm going to do something with it. 
we have uh, HTTP response handlers and interface, and we all know what interfaces are now. We can implement this with something special that decides how to handle a response. Or we can use one that's already created called basic response handler, which provides basic functionality for handling a response from a website or you are an HTTP URL of some kind. Okay, so this response is going to be whatever data we get back when we hit a URI. Typically, when we access a URI, we're doing it in a browser. And the response from that URI is the HTML markup that the browser then renders. So when I say request, think about typing in a URL. When I say response, Think about the data that comes back from that URL that our browser then renders. Okay, HTTP client is a class that has some methods that just coordinate this request and response. Like I say, it seems like a lot of things going on, maybe more confusing than it needs to be. So I have an example here, and this is a few lines of basically boilerplate logic. This is what we're going to throw together. It uses the very basic default nature of each of these classes, and that's ideal for us. Notice that nowhere in here does it have anything specific about plants or any kind of data. It simply is accepting a URI and getting the response and returning the response. So really, I suppose I could just copy and paste the string, this uh, well, this this entire chunk into my method, but. Let's go ahead and type it out one at a time. So, I'll go back to Eclipse. So, I'll move over Eclipse here, and we'll take our request method, and we'll add these one at a time. Remember, this is going to receive a URI, a URI that's going to look a lot like our plant search here. Okay, so we're going to have a method like HTTP, and then a domain name, directory structure, a page, and this is a Perl page, and then some parameters after that. Okay, so it's going to accept a URI and then it's going to get some data and return that data back. So I'll put some comments here on each method. We don't need to comment the entire method because that's already been commented in the interface. Okay, so I'll say create the return variable. Okay, string return string equals boom boom and then return return string so that will satisfy our return statement until we actually uh, do the actual implementation now i'll say http client http client equals new default http client notice what i'm doing here is that http client is a is an interface and it is implemented by this default HTTP client, which is kind of like just a simple implementation for basic uses like ours. I do a control shift O to organize imports. And we see that as we hoped, it properly pulled in the right things from the org.apache.http package. Okay, so uh, I'll say start or create a default HTTP client. Uh, object okay and then we'll say okay create a get object with the URI that we have been provided so we'll say HTTP get HTTP get equals new HTTP get and what we can pass to this is the string URI that we've received okay once again, control shift O to organize imports. We could pass in that, or we could pass in a URI object, which the Apache libraries will help us to put together. This will be just fine for our purposes. Okay, now, response. Okay, let, let, let me put a comment. Uh, create a response handler to handle the response. Once again, a response handler is a generic identified interface that says I'm here to get the data back from the URI and decide how I want to make it available. 
we're using a very basic implementation. We're just saying get it back as a string. So response handler, response handler, that's an interface. We need to declare an object and put it into that interface. So we'll say equals new basic response handler. Okay, control shift O to organize imports. And then finally, we tie together our request, which is this HTTP get, with the response, which is this response handler, by using this default HTTP client. So tie together the request and the response. Okay, so, uh, we'll do HTTP client dot execute. Okay, HTTP get response handler. Okay, terminate with the semicolon and control S. And we see we have a red line. Unhandled exception type client protocol exception. This is a checked exception. It says something might go wrong here. What do you want to do? Now let's think very seriously about this. If I have a network error, what might cause it? It might be that I don't have phone service in that area. Maybe I just don't have service because I'm somewhere that's far away from an antenna, or maybe I'm in a basement somewhere, or maybe I'm in a different country. Is there anything we can do at this low level to handle that? And the answer is not really. The best thing, we certainly don't want to raise a toast, not from a level like this where we're using only uh, Apache object, Apache package objects and classes. We don't want to raise a toast because we're not Android specific here. So what we should do is re-throw the exception and let the layer that called us deal with it, okay? So we'll say, hey, I can't connect to the network. What do you want to do? We'll re-throw the exception. The ideal thing to do would be to fail over to a local cache of these plants instead of using the one online. So this is where we have to make a very conscious decision. What do we want to do if we can't access the network? And the answer here is going to be rethrow the exception and then make the calling method decide what to do. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, add a throws declaration. Probably there will be a few more. Uh, let's make it more generic and say IO exception. Yeah, those, those two should be fine. Client protocol exception and IO exception. I think those two will be fine for us. And I hit save. Now it's a bit mad at me because I've added this throws clause here and thus it no longer matches the method signature of the interface. So I'm going to go back to the interface. Okay. And I need to add the throws clause to that as well and save. Okay. Now everything's fine. So once again, when we get an exception, we have to think very carefully what we want to do. One thing we absolutely do not want to do, and I'll be looking for this when I grade the final project, we don't want an empty catch block. That's very, very bad. That's taking very good information and throwing it away. We don't want a catch block that returns null. Once again, that's taking a very descriptive exception and returning null, which is just going to cause a null pointer exception later in life. We don't ever want to do either of those two. We want to decide, is this an exception I can recover from here? If the answer is no, rethrow it. If the answer is yes, go ahead and recover from it here. Okay? Or am I in a user interface method where I can inform the user that there was an error and ask the user what he or she wants to do? If so, we can do that. Okay, be very careful. Now, this HTTP client execute is going to return a string, which represents the response from this URI. So what we need to do is assign that response to our return string object, like so. And there we go. So this is going to represent the response. I'll go ahead and hit save. If we look at the uh, plant places, the response is going to be exactly this. If we put genus equals AVs, this is going to be the string that we get back in response. Okay. If I say genus equals Acer, which is a maple tree, we see we're going to get back a whole bunch more. But in any case, this is the string that represents the response. And that's what we're doing here. 
Notice that because this network DAO isn't dealing with any specific data type, it's just dealing with string in, string out, we'll be able to use this several more times. So our next step is going to be to make a plant DAO, which will interact with this request DAO. So for our plant DAO, I'm going to come over to the DAO uh, package. And once again, we'll start with an interface. This interface is more important than most because this interface might be implemented a few different ways. The one I'm writing now will be an online plant DAO, which means we have network coverage. Later, I might also wish to make an offline plant DAO for when we do not have local co uh, network coverage it can use a local database instead. So in this case, an interface is very important. Okay, I create a new interface and I say I plant DAO. Okay, and finish. And now remember, a DAO is typically something that fetches data, inserts data, updates data, and deletes data. Okay, so these are things that are going to be interactions with some kind of persistence mechanism. So I put the copyright at the top. Okay. And then within the DAO, I'll put a note here. Ax, uh, let's say CRUD operations for a plant. What's CRUD? Create, retrieve, update, and delete. The major database operations. Create, retrieve, update, and delete. Now, the first one we're going to do is fetch a plant by a search criteria. So we'll say fetch, uh, let's say, well, let's think about this. Public, okay, it's going to return a collection of multiple plants, right? Well, first of all, why did I even make it public? I made it public because we're going to want to call this from our service layer. Okay, now, what return type do I want? Probably array list plant because and is plant what I called our DTO? Let me see. Yeah, I called a plant. Okay. Because we want to return a collection of plants. We want to return a collection of plants. So public array list plant fetch plants fetch uh yeah fetch plants by search. Plants because plants with an S because we'll probably get more than one plant. Now what object does our plant search, let me find that guy. What object does our plant search activity use? If we go to search plants, we see it, it is well as using a plant DA or DTO object. It's using the, the one that we called here plant, the one with all the getters and setters. Remember a DTO will typically have a bunch of getters and setters that represent the attributes of that DTO. Okay, so, for my iPlant DTO, it's going to return a collection of fully populated plants, and it will accept one plant object, which contains the search information. So plant, search plant. Okay. Okay, works for me so far. I'm going to Control Shift O to organize imports, and I'm going to put Java.comment. Remember, what I'll do for Java.comment is typically we'll start with the method signature. And then we'll do the slash on the question mark key and two asterisks, and then enter. Okay? So we'll say fetch plants that match the search criteria. Okay? Uh, search plant, a plant DTO that contains search criteria. Okay? Return a collection that contains plants, let's say plant with the capital P, plants that match the given search criteria. Okay. And we save. Okay, there we go. Now, remember, I'm going to want to make two versions of this. One is an offline version that I'm making right now. And another is, I'm sorry, online version rather is what I'm making now. And the other is going to be an offline version that I'll use when I don't have network coverage. The online version will access the network DAO. So, 
I right click, choose new, class, and for the name I'll say plant, or let's call this online plant DAO. And for the interface it implements, of course, we'll say I plant DAO. And there we go. I plant DAO. Okay. Did we get that? Yeah, we got it. Okay. So this represents online plant DAO. In other words, the DAO that we're going to use when we have network coverage. And I choose finish. Okay. No surprise. This is going to give us the fetch plants by search method that we just defined in the interface. Now, we don't want to do all that Apache stuff in here. Instead, we want to reuse what we did in our network DAO. Okay. All we want to do here is we want to assemble a URL and we want to pass that URL to our network DAO. So I'm going to make an attribute. Okay. Attribute for our network DAO. Of course, when we define the attribute as a variable, we'll say I, we use the interface type, I network DAO, network DAO. And then what we might do, uh, sorry, I never, sorry, I don't know why I did that. What we might do is we might make a new constructor that, that uh, instantiates this object. So we'll say public online plant DAO. Okay, just like a normal constructor. Okay, instantiate our network DAO so that we can use it. Network DAO equals new network DAO. Now, it, it, at this level, we cannot instantiate an interface. We have to instantiate a class that implements that interface, and that's what we're doing here. Okay. So, I need to do a lot of things in my fetch plants by search method. I need to, let me put some comments here, assemble a URI, pass the assembled URI to the network DAO, receive the response. Okay, parse the response by the delimiter. Uh, actually, first, Iterate over each line of the response. Okay. Okay, I noticed that we lost sound there, so I stopped the recording. Not to worry, though, all I was doing is saying each of those steps that I was typing out, so no major loss. Needless to say, we're coming up on the 40-minute mark. I'm going to go ahead and stop and save this recording now, and we'll pick it up in the next part. We'll fill in each of these blanks, and then what we're going to do is we're going to invoke the appropriate method on Network DAO. Once we've completed out this working implementation, we're going to create a plant service that implements iPlant service and have it called down to this online plant DAO. So lots of great things to come. Uh, we'll start again in just a moment.